a little bit of relative geography for you in terms of location to show you where and what context uh, the region falls within the larger mass. The reality is that Central Asia is a term that is appropriate for the definition of this region simply because it's really in the middle of the Eurasian continent and in terms of distances, about equidistant through most places, particularly when it comes to uh, the location of this region in relation to other regions. What's also important is uh, something that's very uh, uh, visual to you, is that all of these countries are landlocked. They have no access to the, uh, to the seas, which remains an important venue for transportation of goods and services created, because the per ton mile cost of transporting goods uh, through water is cheaper than any other means of transport. So they have relative inconveniences, if I may use that, that term, in relation to their ability to trade. And in recent years, this area has become extremely important for a variety of reasons, one of which is oil. Oil and gas is, in fact, very, very largely available in this area. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan have large pools of oils, which, of course, immediately uh, interests uh, countries like Western European countries as well as the United States. And so our involvement in Central Asia has really increased quite, quite dramatically in the last 15 years. Not only because of oil and gas, but also because we realized that by being present in what is a former Soviet Republic, it will simply annoy the Russians. And we appreciate annoying the Russians when possible. And so what happens is, and it's been a successful, by the way, presence in our case. So in reality, then, not only do you have landlocked states, but one of those countries, Uzbekistan, is in fact one of two countries in the world that is doubly long-locked. What that means is that if Uzbekistan wants to trade with other countries, say in the West or in other parts of the world, like in, uh, in Africa, for example, they have to not only negotiate it's landlockedness with a neighbor, but they have to negotiate with two neighbors, so it's doubly landlocked, okay? Perhaps all of you can figure out which is the other country in the world that is doubly landlocked as well. It's one of those trivial pursuit questions that it is not always easy to answer. The region then is uh, based on these five countries, as I mentioned to you, former Soviet republics, and uh, uh, two of them have access to the Caspian Sea, which is a landlocked uh, sea or lake, if you prefer, very large lake. Also important is the proximity, geographically wise, to areas of the world that are extremely interesting, interested uh, from a national security perspective to not only the United States, but also the European countries. By virtue of Afghanistan being located directly south of three of these countries, gives you an idea of what uh, importance that could be. So it is important for us Americans to have a good relationship with these countries in order to gain access to Afghanistan in light of the fact that we are at war with that country. And so whether you agree or disagree with our presence in Afghanistan, that becomes a personal view of yours. But the important thing is that we are there, and therefore we need to, somewhere along the line, locate our bases and and protect our uh, military people appropriately with hopefully friendly uh, countries. Notice that next to Afghanistan and south of Turkmenistan is also Iran, again, a foe of the United States as we see it in that particular region. This is an area that is actually hot, and I mean that in every sense of the word. Um, I've been very fortunate, I've traveled through all of these countries in uh, numerous occasions, again, like I mentioned to you before, I'm gonna be in Bishkek, formerly known as Frunze, in another month or so, and I intend to not only cross the border to Tajikistan, but I will be traveling through the Pamir Mountains in this region for approximately, hopefully, about two weeks' time. Uh, so, uh, now mind you, one of the things that I've done, and I've published a paper several years ago about what is the status of this region, of this region in terms of each of these countries, in reaction to what the Soviet Union used to have as a policy for the country. The, and I'll be mentioning this again in a few minutes, the Russification process, that is, the, the, the Russian culture within the Soviet Union wanted to convert everybody into a Russian-like culture. And so they entered this region with that in mind. And during that period of time, conflict has always existed in the region. It's just that when you have a media, such as the Soviet media, which was a closed media, we in the West had very little information about what was going on domestically within the Soviet Union, 
we often didn't hear about the various ethnic uh, uh, conflicts that existed within the country. Once in a while, somebody would either escape from the Soviet Union and tell us about that in the West, or you would have tourists, American tourists, visiting the area and timing uh, sometimes plays an important role in what occurs in various parts of the world, and they would see for themselves that there was a problem in terms of the relationship between various ethnic groups. And they would report that once they would leave the Soviet Union. And you know, sometimes the media in the United States or Western Europe would pick up the story, sometimes they wouldn't. But the idea that conflict exists there at this time is not something that started in the last few years. It has existed all along. And that is probably one of the main themes that I want to share with you this, uh, this uh, morning. So the idea is that when you look at the shape of these countries, and geographers look at this, and political scientists uh, do this, one of the things they try to do is to understand how a place uh, works, and shape is not the primary reason ever, but certainly shape plays an, a role in the big picture, in the whole holistic approach of understanding the region. And we geographers do not ignore shape by any means. And when you're looking at some of these areas, particularly here, along this region known as the Fergana Valley. And the Fergana Valley is among the most fertile valleys in the world. Now look, it doesn't compare to the Imperial Valley of, of California. The Imperial Valley in California is light years ahead of the Fergana. But having said that, the Fergana Valley is extremely important. One of the products that they, or one of the crops that they produce a lot is cotton. And in fact, chances are that if you are wearing a t-shirt or a sweater or pants made in China, it is likely that the cotton that the Chinese used to make that t-shirt you're wearing originates in Central Asia, particularly in Uzbekistan, uh, or southern Kazakhstan in this case. The capital city of Uzbekistan is Tashkent. Notice how close it is to the border with Kazakhstan, approximately six and a half kilometers, which is about four miles. Imagine you being able to go in four miles and cross an international border. And then how do you administer a country, which in fact its capital is surrounded a lot by a foreign country, and then you have to administer people in this part of the country. And all of that will come to pass as I will explain things to you. The same applies for other parts of the, of the region, by the way. Ashgabat, the capital of Turkmenistan, is literally 11 miles from the border with Iran. And in fact, yes, I did travel, I drove right to the border and saw what the Iranian border looks like. If you're in Dushanbe, the capital of Tajikistan, once again, very close to uh, Uzbekistan as well as to Afghanistan. Bishkek, the capital of Kyrgyzstan, literally approximately 14 miles from the border with Kazakhstan. The former capital of Kazakhstan was known as Almaty, still the same name right here. Look what it's located. Literally, no more than 10, 12, 14 miles from the border with Kyrgyzstan and near the Chinese border as well. Well, I'll talk to you a little bit about that later by letting you know that Almaty was, the capital was moved to Astana uh, up there in the north for, among other reasons, the ethnic issue that I'll be talking to you about a little bit later. Astana, by the way, is a Kazakh word that means the capital. Just a little bit of trivia for your, for your uh, information. So the idea is that all of these places play an important role, among other things, in terms of location, but also in administration. Now, what's important here, too, is the shape of these countries, which I alluded to earlier. And notice that the shapes are very irregular, very odd, and in fact, in many cases, very intrusive. There are many of these countries have what are known as uh, political exclaves. That is a piece of land that belongs to one country surrounded by another. Uh, one of the examples of that is here in uh, Kyrgyzstan. This little exclave belongs to Tajikistan. These two exclaves belong to Uzbekistan. So Uzbek citizens and Tajik citizens live surrounded by Kyrgyzstan. You can imagine some of the potential problems that could exist when disagreements come about. And there are plenty of those. There are exclaves not only throughout uh, Central Asia, but throughout the world. In Europe, you find dozens of them. In fact, the United States has two exclaves. One of, one of them in a neighboring state not far from here, the uh, state of Minnesota, uh, the Lake of the Woods, also known, known as the Northwest uh, Angle, and then in the state of Washington, Point Roberts, which in fact the only way you can get to those two particular exploits is to go through foreign territory, of course Canada in both cases. 
uh, but they are, it's American territory surrounded by Canadian territory. And the only way you can do it is by crossing the border. And that itself has many, many, many meanings. Okay, so then the, the, the one thing I wanted to mention about the shapes of these countries is that these shapes are not natural shapes. These shapes were imposed upon largely by one specific Soviet government very early in the Soviet uh, uh, history. A man called Joseph Stalin decided that one way of weakening the strength of each of the ethnic groups was to divide them. Because when you divide an ethnic group, you can conquer them more easily. So what you see here are truly boundaries that are shaped in order to break up the dominance of the local, or what I will now call the titular uh, ethnic group. The titular is the majority of a minority until independence they become the majority of the majority, if that makes any sense. I hope I explained it well. So one of the things that uh, uh, Stalin had done is create these artificial boundaries in order to minimize the strength and the cohesiveness of these particular groups. So if you have a chance to, to read uh, with care the, uh, the, the ethnic violence that took place in the Kyrgyz Republic in the city of Osh uh, about a year ago, as a matter of fact, in which over 2,500 people were literally killed, even though the newspapers keep saying that it's about 60 or 70 people that had the misfortune of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. That is truly hogwash. This was not an event that was uh, accidental, these people were not in the wrong place at the wrong time. Many more people were simply slaughtered simply because of the ethnicity that they belonged to. And the confrontation, or what I will later on refer to pent up energy, uh, is in fact one of the major causes and for political reasons and generally the motivation is purely political. The leadership of the countries who want to retain their leadership throw in uh, gasoline into the uh, neighborhoods and the areas, and then they throw in a match. They walk away and see what happens. And meanwhile, people who are usually misinformed uh, begin to go after each other. So you have people who are truly, have been truly neighbors for many, many, many years. Suddenly, because they are of a different ethnic group, they simply slash into the other. And the, and the conditions that existed in Osh last year are conditions that I, I would venture to say, without exaggeration, the majority of you here would simply not believe. And if you were to see it, you probably will turn the film off or not want to see the photographs. The word atrocious is very conservative. The, these people were brutal. And the conditions were very brutal. I, I don't know if I have good news or bad news for you, but I'm going to be in Osh in a few weeks. Okay, so the idea then is what I'm doing is I'm setting you up. I'm setting you up to create a series of conditions that will likely be contribute heavily to the, to the uh, potential of igniting uh, problems and confrontations between people who otherwise like each other, live together, and share meals. Uh, and so one of the things I like to do is to also share a little, a little with you about the physical context of the region. And when you look at uh, the area of the former Soviet Union, the, the, the five new Central Asian uh, regions, you can divide them into two different, different uh, physical uh, entities. Uh, three of them are really very much like the mid, uh, Midwestern part of the United States, relatively flat environments, very much like the Great Plains, relatively flat environments, the great fields of Kazakhstan, for example, where the where the Mongols would conquer uh, the, the various regions, and we'll talk about the Mongols shortly. Uh, so when you're looking at the area of Kazakhstan, parts of Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, relatively flat environment, uh, uh, not ex excellent for uh, agricultural activity, but not bad either. And what has really caused a problem in terms of agricultural activity in this region was the discovery of gas and oil, and also their uh, quickness in beginning to trade with uh, outside, uh, with uh, foreign enterprises, which were willing to pay cash. So suddenly money began to come into these areas in, in numbers that they had never envisioned in their entire existence, certainly under the Soviet system, which in fact had a centrally planned economy, which in fact Moscow controlled every aspect of the economy, and the periphery would benefit not, okay? Uh, and suddenly, you, you've got situations where the periphery is benefiting, and they don't feel like they're the periphery anymore. 
So now the periphery or the hinterland was no longer a hinterland because now you have these American engineers and American business people and European engineers and European business people coming to my city to talk to me about how much they're willing to pay for a product that I'm willing to give it away for free. And, uh, and I'm not exaggerating because often there are cultures that see oil or gasoline or gas and they don't see any value to it because again, it's a resource based on how you and I define a resource. The only reason oil is important is because you and I think it is important. And we use it and make it a situation where we're dependent on it. But the reality is that oil is worthless otherwise. So as long as cultural entities define something as being valuable, it has no value. Okay, so the two countries, the smaller countries, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, are mountain states. And these are areas with tremendous hydro potential. As a matter of fact, Kyrgyzstan alone, and we don't know much about Tajikistan, part of the reason why I wanna go there, among others, we don't know much about the potential in Tajikistan, but I do know that the potential for hydropower in Tajikistan is enormous. In fact, there's a dam that is very, very large here that inspired a movie known as Dr. Shivago. If you ever heard of the movie Dr. Shivago, it doesn't look anything like that because when I visited, I was expecting to see the same thing as the movie. Well, don't even try it. Uh, it looks very different. But that dam inspired the, the book and inspired the, uh, the movie. Okay. But Kyrgyzstan, I know something about. And the potential hydropower of Kyrgyzstan alone can supply enough energy for the needs of all the five countries of Central Asia plus all the neighboring countries with the exception, well, no, it doesn't include Russia because Russia is not borrowed in Kyrgyzstan. So it includes Kazakhstan and includes many of the countries in this region. Imagine a tiny little country having the potential of hydropower that would supply the needs of the entire region. Now, that's the good news. The, the, the not so good news is that uh, when I show you a map of the population distribution, the amounts of people who live there, it really is quite small. So the demands are not necessarily those of a huge population. It's the population that exists now and at the rate of growth that the, that the population is experiencing, which is fast, by the way, okay? So the idea then is that when we look at a, uh, this region, we're looking not far from Central Asia, a great plains area, some plateaus, mountain area here, not far away, one, the, the highest uh, plateau in the world, the Tibet Plateau, again, potential hydropower there as well, and this Himalaya separating Central Asia from South Asia, which poses problems of trade, but that would be a topic for another uh, presentation at another time. Kyrgyzstan alone, tiny little country, separated and split by a mountain chain between the north and the south. Inasmuch as in the United States we have the, the whole idea of the north and the south being different regions, in Kyrgyzstan you have the very same situation and almost for the same reason. The ethnic differences, the value systems, what predominates in each of these regions. Here is more complicated by two facts. One of them is the fact that the country is very small, landlocked, and number two, and equally important, is that we're not talking about the division being two or three ethnic regions, but uh, dozens of ethnic groups. Literally dozens. If you travel to Isikul, there's a town called Karakol, you will find Uyghur Chinese uh, uh, ethnic groups. You go down to the area along the border in this region here, you will find people who are Narin ethnic groups. The, the, this mosaic is so complicated that really, it, it would take a lifetime to truly try to understand it, never mind looking at their own values and, and their own uh, uh, goals. The Fergana Valley is located right through here. It encompasses at least three countries, some people say four, and again, as an agricultural base, it certainly uh, plays a very important economic role in the region. What's interesting too is that the Population density in this area is among the highest in the world. Look, it doesn't compare to Hong Kong, it doesn't compare to the low countries of Europe like the Netherlands or uh, Belgium and, and Luxembourg together, but nonetheless, it's very, very heavily densely populated. Where then you can go to other parts of the region where you will find virtually no one living there. And I'll show you a map in a few minutes with that. The landscape can be quite, quite uh, interesting. 
The Celestial Mountains, also known as the Tian Shan, separates northern uh, Kyrgyzstan from southern Ky Kyrgyzstan. If you want to drive this, you got to do it during the uh, warmer months. And you're looking at a trip from uh, Bishkek to Osh of about 18 hours if you don't stop. However, if you fly uh, in a small airplane, it'll take about 35 to 45 minutes. So yes, there's an incentive not to drive unless you really like to drive. And if you want to do it in the winter, well, you wouldn't be able to. The, the, the mountains are prohibitive. The valleys are relatively narrow. The transportation network is poor, although it's improving a lot with the help of the European community and also the United States in that order. Uh, highways are being uh, built mostly to create what is known as the New Silk Road. And that is to connect China with Europe uh, via highways in order to move goods produced in China to be delivered in Europe for consumption. And the main reason is because if you are uh, going to the People's Republic of, Republic of China and you want to uh, wait for your uh, ship to leave, there is approximately 120 to 140 day wait for the ship that you are hoping uh, to uh, get your goods delivered to wherever you live, particularly in Europe, before the ship even goes into the harbor in order to be loaded. So if you go to the coast of uh, Shanghai and some of the other areas, you will see hundreds of ships waiting their turn to enter the harbors to be loaded. And so the new Silk Road then becomes a uh, releasing valve for the pent-up uh, delivery schedules that exist going by water through Kazakhstan and so on. In fact, I was part of a group of about eight people who were involved in negotiating uh, the transit rights of China through Kazakhstan eventually to Europe. And uh, that took place about two years ago, and I spent about eight weeks in that area doing so. With a landscape like this, Kyrgyzstan, of course, and Tajikistan have all kinds of uh, problems. Here, to give you an idea of population density very quickly, here's Tashkent, the capital of, uh, of uh, uh, Uzbekistan, um, is the largest city in uh, Central Asia, and during Soviet times was the fourth largest city in the Soviet Union after Moscow, uh, St. Petersburg, and uh, Min uh, Kiev, excuse me. I was going to say Minsk, but Minsk is after that. Uh, Kiev. And so Tashkent really was, uh, is a very large uh, city. However, in the context of the area, notice that the, most of the other area has a very low population density. I included part of South Asia to give you an idea of the population density in uh, India, which is the country that has the second highest population in numbers in the world after the People's Republic of China. Uh, also notice the absence of populations in certain areas between Tashkent and Tehran, the capital of Iran, you have Ashgabat, the capital of uh, uh, Turkmenistan, uh, Turkmenistan. Just north of that is the Karakum Desert. And the Karakum Desert in the summer reaches temperatures of about, oh, easily, between 130 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Nothing lives there. It is it's just simply prohibitive. Even scorpions look for Florida. This particular map shows you a little bit about some of the economic activity in the area, in this case, transhumans. Those of you who are not familiar with that term, uh, transhumans refers to areas of the world where farmers or, or uh, pastoralists follow animals seasonally. In the wintertime, the, the animals go down in elevation. In the summertime, when it gets hot at the, in the valleys, they migrate uh, up in the mountains. I took this photograph uh, not uh, more than a couple of years ago, and I kept asking the farmer or this particular guy about the transhumans, and he, the little I could understand, gave me the impression that this is, uh, uh, you know, this, this has been going on for generations, generations, and generations of people in his family. But the point of my giving you, uh, giving you here is that these are people that are largely isolated, and as a result, they develop their own idea of self. And with that comes all kinds of value systems that when they begin to mix with other uh, ethnic and cultural groups, you can expect differences to exist. The yurt, which is one of many uh, dwellings throughout the area, shows you the type of isolation that some people live in this region. Uh, the nearest yurt was at, at least two miles away, if not more, from when I took this photograph. Notice that we are above the tree line. Okay. 
This particular map shows you a little bit about the background of what I now will call Central Asia as a true crossroads of cultures in the world, more so than some of the other areas that take credit for that. Not that the other areas don't have the, uh, the same uh, uh, definition, but this one is truly an amazing situation. When the Mongols, actually before the Mongols, the Turks came into this area, conquered the area, gave the region, among other things, Islam, as well as the Turkic languages. As I will show you a little bit later, four of the five Central Asian countries have Turkic origin languages, including Uzbeki and Tajik, not Tajik, Uzbeki, uh, Kazakh, uh, Kyrgyz, and Turkmeni are Turkish languages. If you know a little bit of Turkish, you will go to these areas and you will recognize the language. You will understand basically what is being said. Unfortunately, Russian has entered some of these languages and as a result of that, there's a tremendous amount of mix in that language. So the Turk will not be able to understand everything. Tajik, by the way, is a language very, very similar to Farsi, which is a language of Iran. So the Iranians and the Tajiks can understand each other very, very well, with differences, of course, colloquial differences from one part of the country to the other. When the Turks uh, were, uh, were removed by the Mongols coming in, the Mongols came into the region and brought their own value systems. As time has it, uh, you will find, once again, the rebirth of Islam invading these regions and converting people to the point in which today Virtually all titular populations in Central Asia are uh, uh, Muslim uh, in name, but not always in practice. One of the things about Islam is that you are, for example, not uh, permitted to uh, drink liquor. Well, um, it's very hard for former Soviet citizens to give up their vodka. And as a result of that, they are a la carte Muslims, okay? So you will see a very, very, very religious uh, Iman going to mosque and enjoying uh, the, the practice of his religion. And afterwards, he will go to a sl small shop with some of his friends or colleagues, and they will have shashlik, which is comparable to a uh, shish kebab, but is the shish kebab of Central Asia. And, you know, nasdrotia, meaning cheers. So uh, there is a conflict between the two, but nonetheless, they don't see it in Central Asia is a conflict. When a Saudi Arabian or an Iranian a cleric comes into the region, they, they, they go berserk by watching these uh, so-called Muslims drinking liquor. So there's all kinds of nuances that we need to be aware of. Certainly, when the Soviet Union, uh, Russia, the Russian Empire began to expand uh, through the works of uh, Peter the Great and then subsequently Katerina the Great, uh, and then the birth of the Soviet Union, as they began to go from the central area of Novgorod, the central part of the supposedly Russian Empire, and they began to conquer all the areas, of course they went down to uh, Central Asia and conquered that area as well, bringing its own version of, of uh, culture and, uh, and enterprise. And as a result of that, by the time you go into this area, you really, unless you really are sensitive to the various cultures that have crisscrossed this region, you would not be able to discern one from the other. I've been back to Central Asia since 2003, really, I, I don't know how many times, several dozen times, and I'm now just beginning to discern one cultural uh, aspect from another cultural aspect. I'm just now beginning to, to recognize the differences and the influence from outside. Uh, and so, Certainly the Soviet uh, process was one of uh, cleanliness as a will, homogeneity, if you will, regarding the culture of this region. And they were largely successful with, with some major exceptions. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, each of these countries have gone in their own separate ways. As I mentioned to you before about the Turkish languages, it's widely spoken in, in, uh, in the region. Uh, certainly, uh, now that the Soviet Union collapsed, Russian has become the lingua franca of the region. A lingua franca, for those of you who are not familiar with the phrase, is a language of communication. Uh, in most cases, it could be the language of business communication, but it doesn't have to be business. It's just simply the language of communication. Today, the number one lingua franca in the world is English, so you're all set. Essentially, in every country in the world, you will find people who speak English. The second most important language in the world in terms of lingua franca is French. So if you know French and you know English, you've just covered probably 80 to 90% of the world's population. 
in terms of communication. Certainly in places like Africa, English and, and French are very, very important. While here in the United States we tend to emphasize Spanish being very, very important, and I just want to remind you that my native language is Spanish, okay? The reality is that outside of the United States and Latin America, Spanish is par not particularly important. Okay, in Spain. But outside of that, Spanish is not particularly important, uh, where French is, and so, well, English the most. Russian is the lingua franca of the region, and very, very quickly, English is becoming a lingua franca as well. Certainly, if you were to go to any of the Central Asian countries, particularly uh, uh, the countries like Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, I promise you that if you meet anyone who's 25 years of age or younger, they speak English. Well, their English will not be sophisticated, it will not be top-notch English, it will not be your English, okay? But let's just say that if you need to find the men's room or the ladies' room, or, you need, or you're hungry and you want to go to a restaurant, you can ask those questions and there will be someone who will say, in that direction, okay? They may answer you in their own language. They may say words like Tam, Tam means there in Russian. Or they may say something like that, but they will point to make sure that you know the direction. So you don't get lost. You just won't get lost. In 2003, when I was there the first time, the number of young people speaking English was easily a third of what it is now. And I expect, as I go, as I will be visiting this region again in the next few weeks, I expect the percentage to be even larger. Because the 25-year-old, the seven years ago, is now 30, almost 35 years old, and the new population are now learning English in the classroom and they do very well. Okay, so the complexity of the region is really quite, quite astonishing. You can be in one village and there may be seven languages spoken and you will meet people who probably speak, if not the seven languages, easily five or six of them, and they speak it well, mainly because of the communication. And if anything fails, Russian kicks in, okay? In Tajikistan, the same thing is true, very, very close to, like I mentioned to you, Farsi, the language of Iran, and, but many of these people speak several languages, something that we don't quite do as well in the United States, as you well know. This particular map shows you a little bit of the language mosaic of the region. The one that I want you to notice is the one in purple, or pink, whatever color you see, this one and that one. That is where Russian predominates. That is where more than 80% of the population uh, speaks Russian and does not speak another language. In fact, it is part of the Russification process that started very early in the history of the Soviet Union, but it took really off in the early 1950s when a man called Nikita Khrushchev, Secretary General of the Soviet Union at that time, decided to create a program known as the Virgin Lands Project. And the idea was, by the way, he was inspired by coming to the Midwestern part of the United States and Canada and was in awe about how well farmers were doing and producing corn and, and, and uh, wheat and all the other products that we take for granted in this country. And he was just in awe about how the Canadians and the Americans were able to, to grow so efficiently this particular crops. And so he began to, in fact, encourage the Soviet farmers to begin to move to this area of Siberia, which, in fact, uh, created a Again, the Virgin Lands Project, in which the majority were Russian farmers who brought their own value systems, their own language. And when Kazakhstan became independent, and I gotta mention to you why the shapes of these states or these countries are, are so, and why these countries were the ones that became independent, not others that could have been. Uh, a region, for example, uh, not far from uh, the Caspian Sea is a place called Dagestan, which means many cultures, many countries, and in Dagestan, Easily you could have had 10 new countries in that particular area, but that did not happen, okay? And the reason it did not happen is because the Soviet, and you can go to, you can go online if you want to look at the former Soviet constitution. The Soviet constitution had one article that said, in the event that the Soviet Union voluntarily decides to dissolve, the countries, the, the republics, uh, in the Soviet Union they didn't call it states, they call it republics, where republic, to the Soviet Union as a state in the United States. The republics that have a boundary with inter an international boundary will then become independent following this Soviet Republic boundary. So if you look very carefully, all of the new countries that are today independent that were part of the Soviet Union 
had a boundary with an international, had an international boundary is what I mean to say. Okay, Kyrgyzstan with uh, China, Kazakhstan both with China, and well, exactly that. Uh, Turkmenistan with Iran, so they, so Dagestan did not have a snowball chance of becoming independent because they did not border with an independent country. They border with today's Georgia, the Republic of Georgia, not the state of Georgia, the Republic of Georgia, but that was not part of the deal. And that was part of the reason why that did not happen. In reality, it, uh, the former Soviet Union would have not been 15 new republics. There could have been over 120 new countries for you to memorize. So I am thankful in a way, because I don't have enough capacity here for 120 new names. Having said that, the Russification process created for Kazakhstan, as I will, uh, as I will mention later, a very serious potential problem regarding the ethnic diversity in their country with the Russians dominating the north and the non-Russians dominating the, the south, particularly the Kazakhs dominating this area here with an island of Russian domination in present-day Almaty, which is the former capital. So Nazarbayev, the president of Kazakhstan, said, oh, how do I prevent all this problem? And his solution was to move the capital from Almaty to the north, to the area where the Russians dominate, and then pay Kazakh ethnics a lot of money to move up there and essentially begin to create a more balanced population. And one important reason is because in the northern region of the virgin lands here of Kazakhstan, the Russians were looking to secede and join Russia. And Nazarbayev was not gonna let that happen. So that, is, that's his, that was his plan, which in fact has largely worked. Uh, Astana, by the way, uh, in the winter, uh, this particular winter that just passed, averaged in the, between the 15th of January and the 15th of February, an average temperature of about minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, nonstop winds. It is brutal, and, uh, and it's not a very, very pleasant place to go. So people get battle pay to get up there and to live in that region. Okay, uh, so this mosaic then creates a series of complications for the various population, and in fact, when you look at this particular map, and the next one will be a little more uh, detailed and easier to, to read, is that in every single case, you see an RU in, throughout this map, that the Russian uh, presence, as well as KZ for Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, and so on. So the whole region, really, the Russification process was one of the major, major uh, ro uh, goals of the Soviet Union, which stopped cold upon independence. This map shows you the actual mosaic of ethnic differences. This is not an easy thing to study. It's very, very complicated. And it's complicated further by the fact that there's so many different languages that unless you're able to learn all of these languages, there's no way you can do good quality field work, and particularly when it comes to the interview process. So you always need someone to help you, and it's not always reliable because they may not know English as well, and so it becomes a very complex series of situations. This map shows you what the Soviet Union looked like, and the chart that I want you to see, the parts, I want you to see the pie charts over here. In green is the percentage of the titular population. The titular population is the ethnic domination, or the ethnic population that is local. For example, in the uh, area of uh, Turkmenistan, this many people are Turkmeni. The rest are other minority groups. However, the minority groups became minority upon independence because before that, the Russians were the majority. So even though there may have been 20% Russians in the area of Turkmenistan, the reality that in the country, they were, of course, they were the majority. Upon collapse of the Soviet uh, Union, the majority immediately became a minority. Then, in the case of uh, Turkmenistan, the Turkmen Bashi, who was uh, leader until he passed away a couple of years ago, just before Christmas, he declared a very simple law at the very beginning of the Turkmeni existence, and that is that really all citizens of Turkmenistan should speak Turkmeni. If you don't want to learn Turkmeni, that's fine, get out of here. So many Russian ethnics began to escape, and, they were, and since they were Russian ethnics, they had double citizenship, they could go back to Russia and begin a new life there, all things being equal, which in fact they were not equal, because there are such things that you can never go back home. If you've been in Turkmenistan for your entire life and you're a Russian ethnic, 
you're no longer Russian. You're now a Russian ethnic in Turkmenistan. Your country is Turkmenistan. Now, you go back to Moscow or any other major city in, in Russia, you are a foreigner, even though racially and ethnically you are, you, you are the same, but you're not culturally the same. So we have to now distinguish between you know, the, somebody's uh, ethnicity with their cultural ethnicity. And that, of course, becomes an even more complex situation. So the titular populations then dominate the local areas, and then when they gain power, they begin to do something else, and that is to be exclusive as well as inclusive. That of leads to conflict. And if conflict existed before, now the new situation exacerbates that conflict and complicates it by many more factors. So whereas at one time you had the Soviet flag dominating the 15 countries now, you have five different flags. Each of them, metaphorically speaking, of course, uh, representing their own path. And that's exactly what has happened in this region. So if you go to Kyrgyzstan and you meet uh, Kyrgyz ethnics, you will see uh, people like these four ladies. And if you uh, know anything about the history of the region, which I shared some of it with you, at one time the Mongols, uh, through Kublai Khan and Genghis Khan, conquered this region, and they brought in not only uh, their culture, but also they father, the man fathered children locally, and the descendants of the Mongol people look uh, very similar uh, as the Kyrgyz do. If you go to literally another country across the border, you end up in a city like Osh in Kyrgyzstan, which are dominated mostly by Kyrgyz, 54% of the city of Osh is Kyrgyz, and the rest are uh, Uzbeks, Tajiks, and Russian ethnic, and so on. You end up in a situation like this where you see uh, Uzbek ethnics making their own drink, which I, uh, it looks better than it tastes. Uh, you end up seeing people that have a physical characteristics and also culturally uh, a lot different from the Kyrgyz, Mongolian-looking uh, people. Uh, you can go to uh, the capital of uh, Uzbekistan, Tashkent, and you will see not only poverty, and, and which I need to talk to you about, uh, but also you will see again the physical characteristics in terms of humans that are very, very distinct with also language difference and so on. The poverty level is such that the average Uzbeki earns anywhere between, I mean, this is a great salary, anywhere between about a dollar to a dollar twenty a day, if they get paid. <clears throat> Sometimes they don't get paid, so they have to trade something. And so it was not unusual for me to walk through the markets and see uh, people like this selling all kinds of spices and trading, not money, but trading spice for something else. If they didn't have potatoes and they had uh, uh, curry, they would trade a certain amount of curry, and of course the biggest uh, discussion is what is the fair exchange? Is one potato enough for three kilos of uh, saffron, for example? And those of you who know about saffron, it goes for about $45 an ounce in the United States. Well, I bought four kilos of saffron for a little less than one dollar. And I gotta tell you, I shared it with many of my friends, and they think I'm God's gift to this world because, did you spend that much money for me? And I would say, yeah, because you're worth it. Okay, and uh, I, 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 much later, I, didn't, I, I had the heart to say, the, fr the fact is that I spent maybe a dollar for all of this. And so everybody wants me to go back to Kyrgyzstan. So you think I'm going there to do research? No, 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 no. I'm going there to get some saffron for my friends. Uh, and also other spices, many of which we don't know here in the West. Uh, many of them Indian spices, Pakistani spices. So if you want good quality curry, you know, I can give you a couple of, by the way, one kilo equals 2.2 .2 pounds, in case you're not familiar with the ratio. So when I bring five kilos, we're looking at almost 13, 14 pounds worth of this stuff. Can you imagine what, what the airplane smells like when, okay. That gives you an idea of some of the problems that sometimes I face as I go there. You can end up in a place like Ashgabat, the capital city of Turkmenistan, near the border with Iran, and all of a sudden you realize very quickly that you may be looking at a tremendous mix of of racial groups and, and ethnic groups from, from different parts of the former Soviet Union. Uh, for example, this lady is an Iranian ethnic. This lady is the only Turkmen in this particular group. This lady came from Tajikistan, and this lady was Kyrgyz, or is Kyrgyz. 
all living in the same village. You have to go back to the era of uh, a man called Joseph Stalin, in case you're not familiar with him. He's responsible for the demise of 22 million uh, people who simply died because they opposed him, okay? And one of the things that Mr. Stalin did during his uh, leadership is that he began to move people back and forth from different parts of the Soviet Union, again, to complement the boundaries that he would create to, to, to break down the power of the local areas. So he would grab a bunch of you know, influential Uzbeks and move them to Siberia. And then he would bring people's Uyghurs from China back to uh, Uzbekistan in order to minimize or break down their influence and their power. And because of language differences, Guess what? It, the communication was difficult, uh, and, and potential conflict uh, became increasingly more real, and that's one way in which he kept uh, much of his power while he uh, uh, led the country. So if you were to go to a place like Ashgabat, you really would not know who you're talking to ethnically until you ask them, and they'll tell you, oh, I'm Uyghur, or I am Narin, or I am uh, whatever, you know, whatever ethnic group they belong. But one thing you can do as a geographer is to look for hints of what you're looking at and what it means. So when you go to a place, in this case, uh, once again in Turkmenistan, you will see that certain ethnic groups have specific uh, styles of clothing and colors and shapes that they use to distinguish themselves from everybody else. This is very, very important, really, because even when you go to Africa, you can determine one tribe from another by simply the clothing styles that they wear. And that tells, and if you have a little bit of a, of a Rubik's telling you, okay, this, 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 you, you can almost predict who it is that you're looking at. And so when you ask them a question, you prevent potentially insulting them, because if you, if you choose the wrong tribe, you're risking your head from being separated from the rest of your body. And sometimes I'm saying that figuratively, but I also mean it literally if you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so there are hints that you can look for in the marketplaces, uh, including styles of rugs and how they're made and the symbols being used. So that allows you to do a really good deal of what I will now call loosely cultural geography. Um, and so, and then you, you can begin to predict, among other things, their activities as well. Uh, this particular gentleman, they're both Turkmeni uh, couples, uh, people. Uh, his hat is very, very unique only to Turkmenistan. You don't find it in other parts of Central Asia or for that matter in, in the world. And then his hat has to be made of a specific uh, uh, um, origin, is that the right word? It's, it's really the, the rear end of the uh, sheep. So you kill the animal and you cut the rear end and then sometimes you wash it, sometimes you don't, and then you just saw it and you put it in your head and you're covered for wind, cold, whatever. Uh, odor is usually not an issue. So the first time I walked into the marketplace, the odor said to me something's wrong with the picture, but then I was given a gift of this hat, so I put it in my head and suddenly I had the same odor as everybody else and I didn't notice it anymore. So it, it, was, it was good. So you can go to other places like uh, along the Silk Road in Kazakhstan, one of many branches of the Silk Road. And again, you can begin to identify different cultures by the clothing they wear, by the styles they wear, by what they buy and what they sell, believe it or not. Uh, or you have people who are already Russified, like this very sophisticated lady who actually decided to pose for me. So she goes, take my picture, took her picture. And you notice that she has a Western-like clothing style, suggesting many things, including a level of education. So I went and I asked her, I said, how come you're not dressed like uh, other people? And she says, well, I have a degree from university. So I said, why are you selling rice? He says, because they don't give uh, jobs to women in my country. And this is what, I, and that's it. That conversation ended right there. By that time, she was upset, she was ready to, hit somebody, and I didn't want to be in her way. And uh, customs, uh, including uh, the role that Islam plays, are very, very entrenched in these cultures. In Uzbekistan, in this case, there is a 
wedding in which women and men are separated. They do not share the same space. Women will, buy, will dance with the women, and then when the women finish dancing, they sit down and the men get up and the men dance with the men, okay? Uh, and then the practice of the, the weddings varies from culture to culture. The first wedding I was invited to in 2003 uh, was this wonderful experience. I thought it was a, 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 you know, I was very blessed and all that. So I go to the, to the wedding and I brought a uh, gift which was clearly insufficient. Because you see, what I should have brought is at least one, if not two, sheeps or goats. I didn't bring that. I brought a small uh, box of chocolates. So they grab the box of chocolates, toss it, and they say, okay, where is the sheep? Well, you know, I didn't know that. It was, I was off the boat just a few couple of weeks. And then I didn't realize one other important thing. The father of the bride, as a token of his appreciation and happiness and so on, gives a horse. A horse is eaten in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. And uh, so the horse has to be killed, consumed, and the sheep follow. Uh, one, minor, uh, um, one minor problem I did not take into account is a cultural difference between them and me, and that is that uh, the wedding ceremony does not end until all the food is eaten. So it could take two or three weeks. In the United States, a wedding usually ends by what, three in the morning? So you get to go home. There, you don't go home. You crash wherever you land, and then you wake up in the morning and you continue eating. And you can, it just never ends. Of course, many of these people have very extended families. And if you have a very extended family and each of them bring one sheep, the wedding will last two or three weeks. Well, I didn't know that. So when I was ready to go home, they looked and they said, you're not going anywhere. But I have to work tomorrow morning. Work? This is more important. So I missed two, we two weeks of work. I was convinced I was going to be fired by the time I got back. I got back to my place of employment, and I explained to them, trying to figure out how do I do this, that I went to the wedding and said, oh, the wedding, no problem. And that's it. That was the entire problem I had regarding missing two weeks of work. I ask you to think about what would happen if you choose to miss two weeks of work for any reason in the world. Let's see what you can tell me at the end of this. You don't show up, do you? You just simply don't go, go there. So uh, the quality of life is not only very, very difficult and, and poverty abounds, you still have issues of uh, potable water, well water being used, and all of this is combined with a lot of factors which I'm leading to, and that is the issue of now, for the first time, many of these people are exposed to what's going on in the West, okay? Whereas in 2003, virtually no one had a cell phone. Now you go to Bishkek, Tashkent, to any of the cities, and you will find not only young people owning a cell phone and using it not different than the way you do, walking down the hall or whatever the case is, but their parents, have cell phones. Often one family may have six, seven cell phones depending on the size of the family. And so once again, you begin to look at the entire region and you, and you begin to wonder what could possibly be a problem regarding conflict and resolution and so on. Is that a five? Excellent. Absolutely, that's what I need, about five more minutes. The making of conflict. Look, economic, to benefit the Soviet apparatus dominated by Moscow, social, that was the case during the Soviet era. They quelch any kind of uh, instability. In this case, it's happening now, where the ethnic groups were under control of the Russification process, which we were talking about before. Certainly religious control, certainly limited autonomy, if any. Political factors, limit or no access to power by the non-titular population controls of every aspect of life, etc. And guess what, in the case of the Kyrgyz, it developed a one side serving only the Moscow proletariat, or so-called proletariat, which really were bourgeois, okay? And, and really the region in Central Asia fed the central place. Independence comes, and all of a sudden they find themselves in a completely different world but not without the legacy left behind from the past. 
So you cannot move away from what you were when things change as you are now. And so many of the things that uh, have, uh, I've mentioned before leads to this particular series of statements. Conflict is not new, it existed all along. During Soviet times, you and I in the West never knew about it. But the number of people killed because they were minority groups or whatever was enormous, enormous to say. Certainly, just before the pre-Soviet uh, collapse in 1990, there were racial riots, as they would call them, or ethnic riots in cities of Uzgen and Uzgen and Osh and so on. And in fact, in many cases, it was really the coalition and the advantage by the powers that be putting gasoline as well as, as matches, live matches into the area to create conditions that were certainly, certainly incendiary. And they were, people were killed by the dozens, if not the hundreds. Just, uh, just uh, a few years ago, there was a huge, huge problem in Andijan, the, uh, one of the smallest cities in Uzbekistan. And the president of the country, Non Karimov, he decided that he wasn't gonna put up with their uh, uh, capriciousness. So he sent the uh, army, his army, and literally wiped out the entire city. Some were able to escape to neighboring countries, and eventually Uzbekistan broke relations with the United States because they accused us of backing those people. And all we did really is send uh, jeeps to get those people out of the border area and save their lives. He took offense to that, so he broke our relations with them. But I got new news for you. About two weeks ago, he declared that Americans are really my best friend. So there is a lot of capriciousness in the leadership itself. In the post-Soviet collapse, the market economy brought increased unemployment, certainly at the beginning, exacerbating the tensions that exist between ethnic groups, competition, and so on. And really, there was a tremendous amount of pent-up energy after the collapse of the Soviet uh, Union, creating the kinds of problems that exist in, in these countries at this moment. Of all the countries, really, Kazakhstan is the least uh, uh, uncomfortable to be in. It's the one that, in fact, Nazarbayev, by moving the capital up there, he is a, it's a dictator by any means, okay? He will probably get 99% of the vote of those people who vote, which are very few in number, but at the same time, he's a benevolent dictator in the sense that he shares the wealth between every ethnic group and makes sure that everybody is happy, and he's able to do that because of the amount of oil that he sells to the West, creating a region that, in fact, neutralized, he has been successful in neutralizing any potential uh, tensions that exist. One way of measuring political tension, by the way, and there are many different ways in which you as a geographer can do this, but one important uh, way to do that is to look at rates of intermarriage between, say, Russian ethnics and non-Russian ethnics. In Kazakhstan, you will see a large number of couples that, in fact, are from different ethnic groups intermarrying, and that gives you a hint of how different ethnic groups get along with each other. It's not the answer, it's not the solution, but it's a hint that tells you uh, that things are doing a, a little bit better. In countries like Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, these are authoritarian regimes. They are not different than the Soviet Union was before. As a matter of fact, in Turkmenistan, if you open your mouth and they don't like what you are saying, uh, somehow you find yourself uh, silenced. And there's a whole array of ways in which you could be silenced. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is the most democratic of the, pro of the countries in the region, and yes, the Democra uh, as democrats they are, they, this is where the problems have been most visible, because there's a, there's a degree of freedom of speech in that area, which means that CNN can come in or Fox News can come in and report what's going on with their own perspectives, and the BBC and other enterprises do the same thing. The last statement, the, or the last slide I want to share with you is the idea of the opportunities that exist in reconciliation. And the only country I can really speak about is Kyrgyzstan, where reconciliation is being actively sought. The idea of neutralizing the ethnic differences that exist between different peoples and the disagreements. In the other countries, they're really silenced or they're content. In this case, there is uh, a dialogue between ethnic groups, although it has largely failed. At least they're trying to talk to each other. There is public participation that has increased. The total revolution is an example of that. The powers of persuasion and incentives uh, are being uh, introduced by the government to try to persuade people to find ways to tolerate each other 
in the hopes that eventually they will get along much better. Uh, there are, the media is playing, particularly international uh, media is playing an important role in helping that. Not to your surprise, particularly as you hopefully are aware of what's going on in the Middle East right now, uh, social media plays a very important role. Facebook, for example, people are talking to each other, informing each other. And there's also the issue of transitional justice, a process by which you cannot bring justice based on how somebody else thinks of it, but as a process to get to the eventual uh, end result, which in fact leads to negotiations and hopefully uh, getting along with each other. The last slide is probably the one that you may be interested in pursuing. Thank you, Leon. Can you hear me? Is this okay? Okay. A great, a great presentation. And again, thank you so much for, for joining us and delivering this. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. I hope it was adequate. Okay. And now, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. I think Mr. Zobel, you had a question? Yeah. Well, oh, hold on, hold on. Pass this over. Yeah, you, <laughs> it's for the video. Uh, there you go. I had two questions. What year was like the discovery of the oil in the region that kind of sparked the influence from foreign? I have two answers for you. One of them is that oil existed in that area all along. During the Soviet era, uh, the Soviet Union produced more oil than most countries in the world, but it was mostly for domestic uh, use. They did not export it. When you and I think of oil, we always think in terms of importing, exporting, which countries are producing, which are consuming, and, and, and the like. The Soviets never asked that question. They had enough oil for their own needs, and they had some of the busiest airports in the world, all military, okay? Uh, and as a result of that, they never had to release that information to anybody. So, but we've known all along that the Soviets were large producers of oil, but domestic consumers. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, suddenly oil was not, all, not uh, only found in one country, but in more than half of the 15 new countries. And each of them said, ooh, this is ours now. We don't have to talk to Moscow at all, so what do we do? Each of them began to go on their own. And then as they began to look, when they began to see the the dollar coming in at the rate it was going in, among other things, greed literally took, took hold, which is a term that we know very well in this country, okay? And they began to say, oh, you know, what do I do? So, they, so each of these countries began to literally call the European countries principally at the beginning and eventually the United States uh, to see who wants to pay more for the oil, and they learned very quickly that by holding out, you can increase the price of oil. And so what was happening is that each of those countries began to export to other places. That's when we began to understand the amounts of oil being produced, mainly because since they cross international borders, they have to follow the international code of trade. Whereas before, it was not an international trade. It was domestic, so they didn't, the Russians could say, we have no oil, and get away with it. So how do you fly those uh, MiGs? Oh, you know, love. <laughs> which was not an unusual answer, because you know, they would try to avoid giving you the answer. So agencies, intelligence agencies like the DIA or the CIA would try to infiltrate the Soviet Union to at least get an idea of what was going on. And that would allow our policymakers in the United States to at least have some leverage in negotiating with the Soviets at that time in terms of trade, the nuclear disarmament issues, and everything else. I hope I answered your question. You did, yeah. Okay. Uh, one more was the uh, the moving of the capital of Kazakhstan. Was that like directly related to how stable they are now? How them being the most stable because they re removed themselves from the cultural conflicts going on in the south? Well, I tell you what, I have about three, maybe four hundred answers to your question. You're you're asking one of the most difficult questions regarding this particular move. From a geographer's perspective, we look at the movement as a movement that is not new. We call the movement of a capital to another place a forward city. In fact, I will share with you an article in a chapter in a book that I just published on specifically this issue of uh, Astana being moved, and I outline all the reasons that, that exist there. Uh, the bottom line, I think, is that Nazarbayev, the president of the, of the Republic of Kazakhstan, just wanted the, the country to remember him after he dies. Uh, it's an, it was an ego thing. And so he began to, you know, he, wants to, he wanted to scratch his ego really well and, 
And he goes, what do I do? What do I do? And he wanted to do something that people will not forget. And then he created a city that was unbelievable. If you like Disney World or Disneyland, you got to go there. The largest mall in the world is being constructed there in which over 50 football fields will fit in with plenty of space uh, to spare. The average temperature of this mall will be approximately 74 degrees Fahrenheit in an area that experiences minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit winters. Okay? Uh, and it will also be an air conditioning in, in place because in the summer the temperature goes up to 105 degrees Fahrenheit with no problem. And so it's, it's, a, it's a land of tremendous extremes. This mall is going to have hockey uh, fields, soccer fields, or football if you like to use that term. It, it, it will be a city inside the city. And I don't have any pictures with me here, otherwise I would show you some of the slides or photographs that appear in the chapter that I will share with Professor DeVivo a little bit later. And you'll share it with whoever is interested you may want to ask. So Astana, in the end, was an ego trip, okay? With it came tremendous benefits. The opening of the, of the economy of that part of the region, which is very rich in minerals, particularly minerals that are very desirable to countries like the United States, including plutonium. Uh, zinc and some of the other ones. It's also an agricultural area because in the southern edge of the Virgin Lands uh, project of Nikita Khrushchev. It also is an area where in fact uh, he brought balance of the various ethnic groups that on the surface get along very, very well, but there is tension in, Asta in Astana where you don't find it in other parts of Kazakhstan. So th there are a lot of reasons, but again, in my opinion, the bottom, line, the bottom line is that it was an ego-satisfying decision. And he had the money. And he's got a lot of money from the oil. And he's got a very good customer in countries like the United States. I hope I answered your question. Anybody else? Other questions? Hopefully. You have a question? Yeah. This is on, right? How did Stalin use those uh, political exclaves to split up different uh, ethnic groups? Oh, it was very capricious the way he did it, or the people that, that did it for him, really. I mean, he just gave the orders and they decided, then he would approve everything that, uh, that any policy that the Soviet Union uh, had under Stalin, he single-handedly approved everything. So ultimately, he, he owns the decisions. He, it was extremely capricious. They would, he would send people to the field, and they would see the neighborhoods that are very cohesive, and he would simply split them. And it actually, it was a very simple process. He would simply split them. And then he would bring, for example, military people from the Ukraine to police the people in uh, Turkmenistan, knowing full well that there is no love lost between these two uh, peoples. I mean, these people did not like each other. So what's the best thing you do to uh, keep people uh, uh, in, in, uh, in control? You bring the people that don't like them and say, uh, now you're the police in this particular area, do your job. Well, if you're Ukrainian and you don't like the Turkmenis and some Turkmeni behaves in a way you don't like, you shoot them. There's no love lost. And basically, I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Uh, there, there were decapitations at that time. Uh, the, I'll tell you a, a story that is, I wish I, it could be, uh, a uh, fictitious story, not at all. Stalin was on record saying that he has tremendous respect for women. And as a result of that, there is no way that he would ever, ever murder women. Essentially admitting he commits murder, okay? So he had no problem murdering men. But with the women, he had utmost respect. So when a woman would be rebellious and would not behave the way he wanted to, he of course did not uh, do that. So the word is that what he did is he would bury them alive with the head above ground, barely above ground. So essentially their chin would be at soil level, and then it would be buried in one position. Now I want you to visualize what that may feel like, and just think of doing 10 minutes of that. Well, some of these very, very strong women resisted longer than 10 minutes, sometimes maybe even overnight. But by the next day, you are on the verge of going nuts, to the point in which many women would beg would beg to be killed. And Stalin was not going to oppose their wishes. So he would cut their heads off. He wouldn't remove them from the ground. He would simply just have their heads off. And his answer of his respect for women was, they begged me. Am I to deny a woman's wishes? 
Now, that's pretty nutty. I think that hopefully most of you, if not all of you, would agree. That is bizarre. But he is on record saying he respects women's wishes. One heck of a way to, to do so. So Mr. Stalin really was not only very paranoid in every sense of the word, and he was really not in this planet, but he acted upon that. He had the power. And the people that surrounded him benefited from his power. And so essentially sold out against perhaps moral thinking, ethical thinking, logic, you know, uh, depends on which side of the fence you are, you're either a freedom fighter or you're a terrorist, correct? It's a matter of who defines it. So, you know, if you, if, if, if you look at the, uh, for example, uh, the presidency of uh, President Ronald Reagan, when he was president, he went to Nicaragua to uh, impose his policy. He essentially supported what is known as the Contra fighters. The Contra means counter, against. And he called them freedom fighters. Well, the people who were in power in, 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 uh, in uh, Nicaragua called them terrorists, and they called themselves freedom fighters. So now, who's right, Mr. Reagan or the Sandinistas who were in power at the time? You know what, that's a decision you have to make based on the facts that you will collect. But it depends on which side of the fence you're in, either you're a freedom fighter or you are, obviously for Americans, anybody who, who is on our side are freedom fighters, period. There's no discussion. And so Mr. Mr. Stalin just simply took advantage of all the tools that he had available to him and divided the country the way he wanted to. And by the way, this is not unique. If you go to the uh, Berlin Tr Treaty of 1882, you will find that the Europeans got together and they divided Africa the way they wanted to. And when you look at the position that Africa is as a continent, particularly the black side of Africa, I'm not talking about North Africa, I'm talking about uh, the Africa south of the Sahara. You're looking at countries that at one time were extremely powerful, extremely efficient, extremely well run, but the Europeans came and split the whole thing up and literally did such damage to the continent or, or black Africa that it's unlikely that they're gonna be in any way or form be able to reorganize themselves in any positive way for certainly the next 100, 200, 300 years. And if you look at the history of Somalia alone, that will give you an idea, never mind West Africa, you will find that the policy of the Europeans is what undid Africa. Who knows what Africa would look like today had the Europeans not made that decision in 1882. Mr. I've got a question in reference to the climate of pollution in the new uh, Central Asia. Have they followed the, the policies of old Russia pre-collapse or are they taking on uh, new policies after collapse? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, for example, Kazakhstan was responsible for the presence of many of the nuclear uh, uh, missiles that were directed towards the West, not only Europe, but the United States, and they voluntarily uh, undid all of that. So if you go to, to Kazakhstan today, you will find no nuclear presence. We cannot say that about Russia, by the way, okay? Russia is still very active in their missile building, and of course they say it's for peaceful purposes, which it may be, you know, I'm not gonna argue one way or the other, but Kazakhstan has demilitarized their uh, nuclear uh, capabilities. Uh, Turkmenistan, we know nothing about because that society is so very close. Uh, I've been to Turkmenistan twice, and everybody who knows about the region says, how did you manage to go in there once? Um, in the year that I went the first time, uh, Turkmenistan gave only a thousand visas to foreigners, including the, the uh, 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 what do you call it, the diplomatic corps. So if, you were a pa if you're an ambassador and you're bringing your family with you and you have, say, a family of five, five of those thousand were already taken, okay? So by the time I got in, I'd never figure out how is it that I was able to get in and I did it the legal way, so it was not like I snuck in undocumented. And then when I went the second time, that was even, it, it impressed a lot of people, it had more than impressed me. Now I'm impressed as I look back because uh, the country only gives a thousand visas for everyone, including business people and so on. And that gave me a, a look at the country. Um, and, and I was able, I was, I was allowed to freely travel throughout the entire country. So I've been from the, Afghani border all the way to the Caspian Sea into the north and so on. 
and, and uh, there very little information is, uh, is released. Uh, the Peace Corps now has four uh, of your colleagues, of your cohorts, in Turkmenistan, and that's new. By the way, those four are taking up four spots in the thousand visas that uh, are available, okay? Uh, I understand that for the year 2011, they're increasing the number of visas, but I don't know by how much. Um, now, when you go to a country like uh, Kyrgyzstan, it's wide open. You can, the, there's, in fact, there's freedom of the press, and unfortunately, the freedom of the press has gone beyond freedom. Now, the press is able to say something about you without verifying. So if they think of you as a terrorist, they'll put your picture in the front page, and they, ver they don't verify. So the, the media has gone to an extreme beyond responsible media coverage or resp responsible journalism. Um, when it comes to a country like Tajikistan, once again, we don't know much about the country because until about four, maybe five years ago, they were in a very bad civil war. The first time I went to Tajikistan, I didn't even realize they were in a civil war until I heard all kinds of noises, which I thought it was, you know, dynamite in the mining areas. It was not dynamite, it was something else. Uh, and so, uh, again, um, the American press did not, did not uh, uh, report on the civil war in Tajikistan. They didn't know about it. Uh, mainly because, again, it's a closed society. Once you're there, you say, uh-oh, perhaps I should have thought of uh, Orlando. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, where, you know, where, where Indiana Jones uses fake bullets, right? That's, okay, that's what I really I was going after. So, I, I hope I answered your question. We if there's something missing, I'll gladly elaborate. We have time for one more question here. Hi, um, I have a question about, um, I guess the cultural power of the social media as it comes into this like pretty isolated region. Um, you've described a kind of absolutism, which is in, in like government leadership that's pretty foreign to us in some ways. Yes. And I'm curious as to what your predictions are for the future of this region in terms of the way that this new generation of young people is going to interact with a very like long legacy of absolutist leadership. Thank you. No, thank you. One of those difficult questions, just like yours. Uh, you know, predictions are easy to say, but they're defied by what happens. <laughs> and I, I'm not very good at predictions. I, I, I have not done very well, although other people think that I'm, I have like a, this glass that tells me what's going to happen because I have been right a few times. The, to answer your question as directly as I can, I myself have underestimated the power of the, of the social network. Uh, and I, I've had to revise my thinking several times, literally, just in the last few weeks. Because if you would have told me a year and a half ago or two years ago that what's going on in the various countries in the Middle East were going to happen, I would have looked at you in this situation and said, look, you know, things like that happen in the United States, that happens in Europe. But in the Middle East, uh, no, I don't think so. It's possible, but unlikely. And today I would have had to apologize to you because the power of the social media in the Middle East has proven to be the most important uh, armament. I chose that word very carefully. Armament that exists to defy gravity. And so, to answer your question, now that I've been going back since 2003 to Central Asia on a regular basis, the, the strength of the social media there is very, very significant. I've been to many uh, uh, internet cafes on a regular basis. Wi-Fi is arriving there, but slowly. Uh, the Hyatt Hotel in uh, Bishkek has Wi-Fi at $39.95 uh, for a 24-hour day that ends at midnight, no matter when you sign in. So if you, if you sign in at 11 o'clock at night, you have a 24-hour uh, period that ends one hour later. So <laughs> if you check into the Hyatt in Bishkek, do so at 12.01 in the morning, and then manage to stay awake and enjoy. So there are other areas that have Wi-Fi in Kyrgyzstan. I'll find out in a few weeks how much more has grown since the last time I was there, which was a little over a year ago. I expect it to be in, uh, a significant increase. But you can go to, net, to uh, internet cafes, and as you walk in, you will see a cross-section of people. Yes, the majority are young people who are playing the video games that many of you play, 
and it's, Facebook is there. Uh, you, you see Facebook and they're talking to people all over the place. Um, and, and many of them are really uh, exposed to uh, a lot more foreign people, particularly Americans, uh, also um, uh, many Germans and uh, other Europeans, but the Germans and the Americans dominate uh, the presence in Kyrgyzstan for different reasons. And with them, they bring uh, their iPhone. And you know, all you gotta do is just begin to use the iPhone, and there's gonna be someone who says, what's that? I want one, okay? Uh, and, and so the diffusion of this media is, is enormous, and what is very significant is that the officials of the government have no clue of what to do. They, they don't know what to do. They, they are, I, I've never seen such insecurity at that level to the point that the second time I was in Turkmenistan, the Minister of Communications came to me and said to me, okay, sir, I like your presentation, it's okay, you know, but tell me, who controls the internet? And I said, well, uh, what do you mean who? He says, yeah, who is the one that has the switch on, <laughs> off? I said, it doesn't work that way. He says, oh, no, 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 Every, everything has one person that decides. Now look, what culture are we talking about? A culture that has a dictator that decides every aspect of it. So the mentality of this individual is there's gotta be one person that controls the whole internet networking. I, I, I will tell you that I tried very hard to explain it to him as best as I could, but I am convinced as I'm standing in front of you that he still has no clue as to what it is what I told him. Not that I understand it fully, mind you, but I have a sense of it. He's still convinced that there's one person. Of course, in his mind, that person is a man called Obama. Because after all, he's the President of the United States. He has to be the one <laughs> that has the switch. And when he, actually, it was not Obama who was President at the time, it was Mr. Bush. So he, he was convinced that it was Mr. Uh, George, you know, George W. Bush who was the President, and he had the switch. And he, he was convinced it was Bush who had that switch. After all, he has that red phone that allows you, you know, to call as president, as leader of the country. So now it's Obama, and whoever will be president in the future will be that one. Th there was no real concept in his mind as to what the internet is. And so, going back to your question, the, the social media is totally under, uh, under, misunderstood and underestimated in terms of what it can do. Now, there's one more thing that dovetails into your question, that is, the generation of young people in Central Asia are nothing like their predecessors. They have more in common with you than you would ever, ever accept. It is likely that they can discuss with you about whatever music you listen to on an even keel with you. They probably know more about some of the things that you uh, uh, hold dear in terms of your music liking and so on, with differences of course. They know about Gaga. <laughs> I met Gaga truly in Kyrgyzstan. They asked me, have you ever met Gaga? I said, what's that? I, I, I didn't know, I honestly didn't know. So they explained to me, I said, no, I never had the pleasure of meeting Gaga. Yes, but you live, live near where she lives. I said, where does she live? She lives in the United States. I said, yes, but the United States is not small, you know. Does anybody know where Gaga lives? And on that note. <laughs> <laughs> but you know we what will. I mean, right? <laughs> thank you, thank you, Leon, for the most entertaining question and answer period. If anybody has any further questions for Professor Yatcher, please feel free to come up to the front. We have about 15, 20 minutes. Otherwise, you're free to go, and thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you for having me.